This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. What up? Welcome in on a Monday. Uh, it's the Monday Mashup. I'm your host, Shane Orling. As always, with me, also as always, Kevin McCann. What's up? With a lot to talk about uh, on this Monday morning. Really, we're recording it Sunday night. So. Yeah. But we're close. We're like yeah, an hour away. You guys don't know. Uh, tons to talk about, really. Mostly basketball, as always, this time of year. But golf was the most electric. Like, I'm a Celtics fan. Right. And I had the Celtics on my second screen this morning. That's just, I wasn't expecting that. I figured you'd have, like, just checking back and forth only when Tiger was playing on the second screen. No, I had the Masters on my TV, I had the Celtics on my computer, and I had the Celtics on mute. The beautiful thing was, like, they started early, so I missed the first nine holes and I didn't care. It was just like, oh, okay, Tiger's eating it for was, the day. It, it was cool because usually, like, the thing that sucks about Masters Sunday, especially for NBA people, is it is going on while yeah. the NBA is going on. And it's like, I don't want to switch back and forth, especially when Tiger's in it because yeah, it's such say, an electric before, thing. I never care. Like, but I don't need it, to see Danny Willett and Sergio Garcia. I always like Sunday at the Masters just for the pageantry of it. My like, game and corner. And, everything about it. Right. Yeah. And so, like, for me especially, I guess it, it sucks when it's – lined up with the nba today was perfect it was awesome today was exactly what it should be half start- time of the game was the 18th hole yes it was perfect absolutely <laughs> yeah. perfect start the masters sunday at 9 a.m every year in fact works do it for every major sunday start it at 9 a.m oh, i mean the I'll british watch. the british starts at like 4 a.m true <laughs> true yeah, we watch it on rebroadcast it's most one of the my time. favorite ones no i thought tiger it just especially the back nine was some of the most enthralling television I've watched in a while. I kept thinking, like, Molinari's just not going to make a mistake. Like, he's so damn mechanical. Like, I don't even know. Like, if he gets a two-shot lead, I don't think he can catch him. And then, boom, that hole does it to everybody. The 12th hole. Like, and it was funny because it was four out of five. Tiger was the only one who didn't go in the water. Yeah. And everybody did the exact same thing. They all shot straight at the flag. And Tiger's the only one that's like, I'm gonna, and even the commentator, I can't remember his name, but he's like, everybody will tell you, play this. There's two ways to play it. You it can risk though. it. Yeah. yeah. You can risk it and go straight at the flag, or you can go between the bunkers on the green. It's hit the safe play. Cut. Yeah. And everybody went straight at the flag, and everybody hit the wind wall, and everybody went in the water. I mean, people have been saying for years, like, if Tiger wins another major, it's going to be at Augusta because he just knows the course too well. He's way too good at that course that he can always have a chance to win there. Like, you saw that on the back nine today. Now I think, like, does the conversation become, can he can he catch Jack? It's like, if it, it I, the ultimate unknown is what happens with the back. Like, the, he's been relatively healthy. I would even say more than relatively healthy since he came back, right? He's now won twice since he came back. But he came back in 2013, won five times, and then had to go away for a little while. Who knows how the back holds? If the back holds up, could he win another Masters? Could he win? I think he could win another British. The PGA, I don't think he can win a U.S. Open. It'll depend where it's at. Yeah, it'd be really tough. But the U.S. Open is notorious for putting it at insanely difficult courses. It'd be be really, really... It's not even insanely difficult... Well, yes, insanely difficult courses, but then making those courses extra difficult for no reason. Because the USGA just fucking sucks as an organization. Yes, they do. Yes, Uh, they do. From a former golf pro, yes, they do. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, No, but I think, like, one, is this the greatest comeback story in the history of sports? Just that he managed to win a 15th. I mean, like... It's easily, like, the most enthralling comebacks because you have, like, your hero just torn down, right? Like, you have a hero that falls from grace like no other hero in the history of sport has really fallen from that high up to that low. I watched, I looked today, and there was a Bleacher Report article from 2009 where they painted him as golf's first villain. I mean... Could not feel further from the truth today. Yeah, and there's some other villains before Tiger... But yeah, I, don't, I, don't, I still think Sergio is a bigger villain than Tiger. Right. I'm not a big enough <laughs> golf guy to run through all the golf villains, but it was like the article was basically like Tiger's a bad guy and you should not like him. There, There is evidence to support that, but I like him. He was piping, I love him. He was piping pancake waitresses. And his like neighbor's 18-year-old daughter who was in high school or whatever. But the, yeah. The weirdest Orlando's thing. Orlando's a hell of a town, you know? That's the weirdest thing to me about this redemption story is like everybody just skips over the bad tiger stuff. Or they make it funny. Like I saw on Twitter, people were pulling up the text transcripts and going, this is my goat. He is my goat. He's like, my, like, he's he's my like, goat. It's the Ray Allen thing, right? 
It's it's the DM for Ray Allen. Every single like, yeah, he's the greatest shooter of all time. Also, this happened. Like, yeah. It really is, yeah, and it's yeah, like right. you'd rather have that than the Ray Lewis mark. Oh yeah, without <laughs> like, a doubt, it's like, not even close. Like yeah, Tiger's crimes. The only victims are like his family. He just did it to his family, like and the other families that he left in ruins. But like, not actual crimes other than the DUI. Yeah, I I think like which is also victimless until you kill someone. It's true, but he didn't. It's true. He didn't do that. No Ray Lewis. It's true. He didn't kill anyone. It just like so he's I just got that going for him. I think it's a good redemption story because I think he's come a long way personally and oh, hell yeah. professionally. And it's been that's in a relationship huge. for two years. When's yeah. the last time you yeah. can say that? Oh, well, Lindsey Vaughn. Was that two years? I, I thought I feel it, like it might have been longer. One. Oh, really? Damn. I don't know how long. I, I just know it was very, very public. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's one thing I know about that. Uh, not huge a golf guy, but I just like I, watching Tiger put on Sunday Red at the Masters is one of the most electrifying things in sports to me like the mock turtlenecks being back all week everything about it i was oh it's it's happening it's on there was a ton of pageantry this morning and it was like there was more you said before the show it was the best moment maybe in the history of golf like without a doubt in my lifetime like absolutely in mine no i'm I'm 26 years old like i there's no nothing the only one that compares is like when he won last year and that crowd of people was walking behind him like that moment was like obviously it wasn't the Masters, but it was a playoff event, right? And like, the fact that this is the Masters yeah, makes it like, just t- even insane. ten times more insane. And that's where like I've never had as much fun as I had this morning watching a golf event. Yeah, and I don't get too sappy for like the whole father son stuff, but that moment, like with the, almost the exact picture, like, absolutely, that was that's cool. it was it was just like, a really cool moment. Yeah, that's cool. The only thing I wish would have happened differently is I wish he would have hit the long putt. Yeah, because awesome. it looked like that he was ready awesome. to punch the fucking I needed, sky. I needed a putter raise. We didn't really get a putter raise on the back nine at all. I needed one putter raise where he just dropped a long one and put it up and started chasing it. I didn't get it. He would have. If, oh, he, yeah. if he hit the long one, you could tell he was ready. His yeah. body was ready to do it, and then it didn't go in. That he did crowd the was ready flip. to erupt. Like, oh, man, it, it would have been yeah. electric. But the one good thing is my dad said... At least this way, it let him hole out and let him be the last putter exactly. on the green. Yeah. Like that made it a little better because he could just walk off and it wouldn't interrupt. I hate when they play threesomes on the final day of a major two. Oh, it is so bad. It's terrible. Um, other than that, some of the other really great news of the week: the L.A. Lakers are maybe the biggest tire fire in sports at the moment. I like. There are so many. Like how fast Luke Walton got another job. That's one point to illustrate. Got a really good how, job, yeah, by the how way. Unbelievably inept they are at handling this coaching and president search. That's another dead giveaway. It's like, funny you brought up like Luke Walton. I just wanted to like jump on a little tangent note here. Yeah. The Kings firing Dave Yerger. I was like, what the yeah. hell? They Kings, fired Mike Malone. They I did go, the same damn thing. I know, with Mike Malone. I go, Kings but, stay Kings. Yeah. Like this is the and then they go and hire Luke Walton. And I'm like. This might actually not be a bad no, move. No, I, I mean, if your front office disagreed with your coach that much and you knew that guy was on the market, that's actually a savvy play by Vladi Divas. As soon and, as it was, I was like, wow, I want, I was ready to kill Vivek and I was ready to kill Vlade, and then they got Luke Walton, and I'm like, so you, I, I can't I mean, hate it. Dave Yeager's going somewhere now, too. Yeah, absolutely. Like and, like, the Cleveland job, I thought Luke Walton might take the Cleveland job just because he has ties to Cleveland, but uh, Sacramento's a way better job. You know who wants the L.A. job? No one. Uh, like, Ty Lue. Oh, Ty Lue needs it. Like, yeah. I think that's the only job he's going to get. Have you heard Ty Lue's name for any other coaching searches? Guy won a title. His name isn't out there. LeBron like, won the title. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, why isn't Mike Brown back on like his own bench again? That's kind of the trouble with the perception, because I bet Ty Lue had it, like, it might have been 10%, but he had something to do with that title. For sure. Like, at least, at the very least, managing egos. Right. The bad part about it, like, the same thing with Eric Spolstra. People are like, sure. oh, Eric Spolstra didn't win two titles. He won just, you know... They want it. It's like, well, he had a little bit to yeah. do with it. And it's also just, that's a problem with the perception for those guys. Cause like, there's a reason Eric Spolstra is still in Miami. Him he's and Pat Riley, coach him and Pat Riley. Yeah. He's <laughs> a really good coach, but him and Pat Riley are boys and it might be tough for him to get a job somewhere else. Cause he's so attached to LeBron and D Wade. Even then though, like, I mean, Spolster climbed the ladder same way as Fizdale. Those guys, they came up as video coordinators with the heat. Right. And his job. And he's also, uh, was I don't forget his dad's name, but he's his dad's kid. Like his dad, right. coach. So like Spolstra is yeah, the last name Spolstra. He's also a little different than Ty Lue because LeBron had David Blatt thrown off the roof of of the queue, and I miss David Blatt. <laughs> It was a fun time. It was a good, it was a good year. And but, Ty Lue was basically just knighted into that position. Yeah. 
And now it's like the only job Ty Lue could possibly get. One, he is a member of the Laker family. Two, yes. him and LeBron are tight. So it's like perfect for him. It's it's a match made in figurative heaven, I guess. Like, it sure is in my heaven. Have fun with it. It's no heaven that I want to go to. I'm not over here like pandering for Ty Lue. I'm good. Like, yeah, I would have been fine with Luke Walton. Pistons lost by 30 today. I still don't want Ty Lue. Like, so the reason all of this happened is Magic stepped down without telling Genie Bus. I mean, like only Magic Johnson could do it like that. Nobody else could do it like that. Nobody else Just has the 15 name. 15 to- minutes before the game starts, the last game of the season, to just walk up to media. Just not even like call a press conference. Most of the people in the hallway just like got alerted like, hey, Magic's going to talk. We're like, wait, what? And he just resigns and tells the whole world, didn't incredible. tell my boss yet. Hope one of you guys can do it. Couldn't face her. I was scared. Like, what? With a big smile on his face. It that was just. smile. And then he went, mm, 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 that moment, it was... And then turns to Rachel Nichols, I need a job at ESPN now, you got me? <laughs> when he said, I, I, one thing I'm looking forward to is that I'll be able to tweet oh, whenever I want. All timeline, all timeline. It was just magic retired from being the Lakers it, president of basketball he should, ops. He should be the actual president. He because gets to tweet whenever he wants. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, yeah. Whatever ahead. he wants, like, whenever he wants. Very good point. <laughs> yeah, he, like, he literally quit... So that he could tweet. And as an honor to Magic Johnson, I want to run through some of his best moves as president of basketball operations with the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, He traded D'Angelo Russell. Yes, he did. uh, All-star in a salary dump to get rid of Timothy Mozgov's contract. He traded D'Angelo Russell, who would, of course, go on to be an all-star. And and he, he got back Brooke Lopez. And then, like, and then that's the next thing yeah, in my notes. Yeah. He let Brooke Lopez yeah. walk after acquiring him in the same salary yeah. dump. Uh, telegraphed the Lonzo ball pick, which let Danny Ainge trade out a number one and still get Tatum. Let LeBron's first year become a dumpster fire because he signed Rondo, Lance, Beasley, Tyson Chandler, and JaVale McGee against even LeBron's recommendation, apparently. He traded for Tyson Chandler. <laughs> Pretty bad. Like, yeah, after you already had McGee. We also can't let him off the hook for trading Jordan Clarkson and Larry Nance Jr. for Isaiah Thomas, Shanning Fry, and a 2018 first that he used on Mo Wagner. That, like, in a way, though, that helped them free space. Like, yes, the the return isn't good, but he got rid of money. Like, Clarkson had a big number. Nance was due for an extension. That got them some money. That's, that's maybe the only, like, somewhat acceptable move he made. There's also one of the most egregious, in my opinion. He traded Lou Williams for picks that would become that's Tony Bradley, one. that would become Josh Hart. That's that's a bad one. I, that's a really bad one. When you give up Lou Williams, sixth man of the year, 45-point score off the bench guy for what would amount to Josh Hart. I, I bet Josh Hart never had two girlfriends that got along. <laughs> <laughs> Lou, Lou Will's just a different breed, man. <laughs> Lou Will's just cut like, different. Yes. He's just cut from a different cloth. Like South Gwinnett, man. Like, yeah. And the thing about it is, I think Josh Hart's a fine player. Oh, yeah. I think he will be a fine player. I don't have a knock for Josh Hart yet. He's not Lou Williams. No, of course not. <laughs> Lou Williams is not literally like, the all-time leading scorer off the bench in NBA history. If you have Lou Williams. Like, literally. And he's got maybe six just, years left. Maybe like, just hang yeah. on to Lou Williams. Like, it was one of the more atrocious. Uh, oh, by the way, they had Lou Williams for like seven million a year. Like it wasn't like he was making something ridiculous. It was like a three for twenty one or something like that when it's, he moved him. Yeah, it it was very team friendly. Yeah, and I don't know why Magic thought better of it. I just I don't know. So this tweet has now been deleted. I guess which I was going to reference. Uh, it was some tweet. Let's just say that it was now I can't even remember who his name, what his name was, the basketball insider who went on a podcast and effectively he's a, he's a Lakers insider. And effectively he said that, uh, Jeannie bus is not interested in hiring a new president of basketball ops. She's going to turn over the, who did I say? She's going to turn it over Polinka. the front office to Polinka. Polinka. Yeah. And Kurt Roblo. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Those two guys. Tall Roblo. Yes. And they're not going to hire a president of basketball ops. There's a rumor that Phil Jackson might advise. Which is just, I mean, he's still making money from the Knicks. Like, you realize that, right? So, like, maybe take that as a sign that the Knicks were willing to pay him this much money to go away. The Knicks. And also, by the way, you have a guy in your locker room 
who is essentially your locker room, who despises Phil Jackson. Like, if LeBron James sees Phil Jackson, you got problems. Don't do that. Yeah, not great. Don't do it. Not great. Uh, And the other thing that, like, James Dolan is the one that okayed the move to say, look, we don't want Phil here anymore. In fairness, he just promoted his GM who was underneath him to president, which is a very James Dolan thing to do. Sure, but it's like... (laughs) Yeah, I'm James Dolan. I'm the like, worst. Like he had another plan. The but, yeah. worst owner in basketball. Yeah. He's like, I just don't even fucking want this yeah, guy so I badly. Leave. I'm going to pay him to not be here. Here's twelve million. Go to a beach. I have a take, and it's got a bit of a local flair for what the Lakers are, what the Lakers will be, as long as Genie Bus continues down this road. They are University of Michigan football. Ooh, ooh, spicy. Ooh. Spicy. Oh, oh, oh. They are living in the past. They just keep bringing back alums. Keep bringing back everybody. In they the are. Family. They are living on sixteen banners that really don't mean shit anymore in the post Kobe world. They are living in a past where they were excellent, even though it's been what eight years since they were really any good. Six. Yeah. Twenty. Well, no, they weren't good in twenty thirteen. At least eight. Yeah. Like yeah, they, eight yeah. would be one year they after made the, the last finals. In 2013, but they were not good. They had three coaches that year. Eight years puts us at LeBron's first finals appearance with the Heat. Right. I think that's about right, because that's when the Mavs went through the Lakers, Which and that was, was the end yeah. of Kobe. Then they tried to trade Lamar Odom to the Mavs, and all hell broke loose. So they haven't been good in almost a decade. Imagine if they didn't veto that trade, though, with Chris Paul. Would have been, who knows, but still. Could be. It's more than likely going to continue. I think this front office situation just severely damages Anthony Davis's likelihood that he goes there. The only thing that saves him is Rich Paul's the agent, so maybe the strings still get pulled. I feel like... But it's also like, yeah. without a front office, they have no chance of competing with Boston or Toronto or the Clippers in getting the assets to get Anthony no, Davis. I think their best moves are to make trades. Like, if you really want to rework something, like, you, okay, one or two of the young guys has to go pick the one you like the most and keep them. But sure. like... As far as going after a free agent like Kemba, I keep hearing Jimmy Butler. I don't know if that's a fit, but apparently it is. He has been in movies before. Shout out to Office Christmas Party. It wasn't very good. Not great. But Olivia Munn, what's up? So here's how I relate him to Michigan football. Because I saw a great tweet. I think it was, it might have been Ryan Rossillo who put out that this is the perfect time. All NBA teams are basically spreading their search, casting a wider web, and looking for guys who aren't yeah. necessarily in the family. Yeah. Like, there's certain ones. Indiana got Dan, or Indiana got Larry Bird, excuse me. Mm-hmm. The Celtics got Danny Ainge. Right. Those things worked out mm-hmm. really well because you've got, like, Larry Bird is a very smart for, owner. For a time, obviously didn't end well, but the Pistons had Joe Dumars. Sure. <laughs> and it was okay for a little stretch. What a title. Like, yeah, yeah, like... They went to six straight conference finals. <laughs> he is like the move for Sheed was the oh, best yeah. thing Joe Dumars ever did. Yeah. Again, family, but that was good. Right. And it's like the Celtics got Danny Ainge. Danny Ainge turns out to be one of the most true general managers in the history of the game. Mm-hmm. You've got Larry Bird, who's just a ridiculously smart owner with Indiana, homegrown guy. I feel like His both those guys there. you saw that coming. They were but yeah, the they're office. good like, basketball yeah. minds. Like the same thing, Kobe. Maybe, but Kobe's I a just, little. I don't see. It. I don't Hurt know had, that Kobe oh is going. God. And especially if Kobe and LeBron are together in like. No. Put, like, no, no, I think that's a disaster. And Phil. Yes. <laughs> like, and that's where I look at the Lakers and you look at every name that's involved and it's like, we got to go get Ty Lu. We got to get Jerry West on the phone. We got to get Kobe on the phone. We got, it's like, you, we're the Lakers. And because we're the preeminent organization in the NBA, you have to be a part of our family. You have to be a Laker if you want to like, work here. That's the thing. Genie Bus doesn't listen to other people. It's the same thing they do at Michigan. It is. You want to be head coach? You want to be AD? You got to be a Michigan man. Yeah. No you have to have Rich gone Rodriguez. to school yeah. here. Yeah. Rich Rod, not going to work. Gonna, we got to go get they, Brady They Hope. brought in Mike D'Antoni and they brought in Mike Brown. And those yeah. guys were out very quickly. We got to get Brady Hope like, because he's a Michigan man. And then Brady Hope on his hands and knees across the country for this job right. he this is michigan for god's sakes like you got jim harbaugh because he was the quarterback he's gonna wear khakis he's gonna wear the block m on his hat he's gonna sit on the sideline and be Jordan a now. michigan man yeah <laughs> they embody the michigan mind and spirit they're champions of the west it's Hard the pass. same thing yeah. that the lakers are where they're like 
we have 16 titles. We're the best organization in basketball. Newsflash, you're not anymore. Montreal Canadian style. Like, yeah. Yeah, you won like 11 titles when there were six teams playing. And it's like a big part of the reason why you're not great anymore is because you refuse to look outside of this family. It's the same thing with Michigan. Why aren't you great anymore? Because you keep limiting yourself. Like when you only look in a certain net of people, you only look at family to be your workers, your employees, your showrunners, for lack of a better word. You're putting handcuffs on yourself. Like cast a wider net and look at people who are qualified for the job and stop saying that they have to be Lakers or they have to be Michigan. It makes no sense. I think back to the night when Magic did it, like that game night on TNT right away. Shaq drops like four names for who he wants. They were all Lakers. Yeah, like Jerry every, West. He said Brian Shaw for head coach because that's worked out so well everywhere else. Like, and it's like I'm surprised Shaq's not on the phone. But the only reason Shaq's not on the phone is because Kobe. Yeah. Like it, I bet Shaq's on the phone at some point. Like. But still, like, even if he does get on the phone and Kobe does have some advisory role with that team, it's like, I don't know if we want Shaq back. Kobe's out here winning Oscars and shit. He doesn't want an advisory role. (laughs) Maybe he does. He's sitting front row with these games. I mean, it is one thing to think, like, that's his former agent. He probably has some say. I don't know if he's shadow running the Lakers like it's assumed out there or however it's conjectured. Like, he's got to have some say over Palenka. There's no way. You, like, you cannot ever tell me that Rob Palenka and Kobe are not in constant contact. Oh no, they are. They like there, yeah. you cannot possibly, t- and you also cannot possibly tell me that Kobe isn't sitting there telling Rob Palinka, man, I think maybe the best move. Like, there's no way that that's not happening. Kobe is it'll as be, in Palinka's yeah. ear as LeBron. It'll be if very not more. interesting to see who they hire as head coach. That's the like, other thing too. Is like people people are looking at this Magic thing, and some of like the Magic apologists are like LeBron forced him out. LeBron shouldn't have this no, much power. He, I don't think LeBron had anything to do with this. I'll say one thing positive for Magic. Three years ago or two years ago, he said, "If I can't get this thing right in two years, I will walk away." He walked away. He did. Like he did what he and, said he would do, and he could have made it way worse, and they would not have fired him. They wouldn't even have thought about it because he's a laker and because he's a family member because it's genie yes it was never gonna happen and he walked away so give i will give him credit for that and that alone he walked away and he could have made it way worse and he didn't so that good for you everything else you were awful like you lasted 11 games as a head coach you lasted two seasons as a general manager you lasted what three episodes as a talk show host like that when the guy knows it's bad he gets out and i'll give him credit for that he does not wait around he's just like nope this isn't working like I'm telling you straight up, Genie Bus is the Michigan Board of Trustees. <laughs> Ward Manuel equals Magic Johnson equals Kobe Bryant equals Rob Palenka. Jim Harbaugh equals Ty Lu. Whoever they like, Jim Harbaugh I think is a better coach football than Ty Lu is basketball. More oh, than likely, I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, Ty Lu's not a great coach. No. Actually, Jim Harbaugh I think is a pretty good coach. The other thing about Jim Harbaugh is. I don't know that he's a great coach. He hasn't had a great team. Well, he has had great teams. He hasn't had great success with those teams. And it's like, go somewhere else and hire someone who's not your family. Hire someone who's not Michigan man. Hire someone who's not Laker. It's like, why is Ty Lu the leading name that I hear? Because he's a Laker. Because Allen Iverson stepped over him once. It's my favorite picture in the history of basketball. Um, I was like... To just and I'm not. I don't want to defend Genie just to play devil's advocate. Excuse me, devil's advocate for a half a second. Like, if you grew up in that organization and you saw your dad run it a certain way, and she's running it blanketly exactly how her dad did. Like she is following it step by step, and you see the success he had with it. I just think you have. Like, I get it. It's in your head that you want to run it like that because they were so successful and everything worked all the time. And if we have a star, we're going to be successful. That's the Jim Bus way. But it is not 1996. And you it's can't also, go get Shaq and Kobe in the same yeah, summer. That doesn't happen. That's. I was just gonna say, like you can run it the way he ran it, but Genie, I got news. Times change. Kareem's not coming through that tunnel. No. Shaq's not coming through that tunnel. I mean, Robert Co- Ori ain't coming through that tunnel. Kobe's coming, coming through that tunnel. Ron Artest. Nothing. Kobe's coming through that tunnel, but it's in a suit, How and he's 45 right years now? old. Like. It, it just like, doesn't happen. This Those guys aren't coming through, and it's like, well, we got LeBron, and then you look at who else you got. Like, I'm sorry, 
you went and got JaVale McGee, not Robert Ory. You went and got Michael Beasley, not Pau Gasol. You went and got Rajon Rondo instead of Julius Steve Randall. Nash. Yeah, seriously, look at the guys who are, who were there last year who aren't there now. Yeah, exactly. They gave $12 million to KCP. There's a very good argument that if you look at the guys who they got rid of, like, and you took the Lakers outcasts with D'Angelo Russell and Julius Randle, all these guys, and you put them on a team, could they compete? With the Lakers now. I mean, I, I legitimately feel comfortable saying this is a fact. They gave Contavious Caldwell-Pope $12 million as a favor to Rich Paul. Like, literally. They gave, because they thought, we gave, what did they give him last year? Like, 20? Yeah. And then they gave him another one-year deal because he couldn't find anything anywhere else. So they're like, oh yeah, go ahead. Like, you don't need him. You got Josh Hart. He took minutes from him all year. Like, it's just a ridiculous thing to do. Can, like, they really turned KCP into a member of the family. He led them in three-point shooting. They are the mafia. He's awful as a three-point. Well, he's not awful, but he's not good. Definitely not good enough to lead you in three-point shooting on a team with LeBron James. Like, you know how many wide-open looks guys get with LeBron James? And, like, you know Jeannie Buss will never say anything bad about Magic Johnson. No. Because he would, not. like, he should be, he, he quit without telling her after she gave him full reign to do whatever he wanted to do. Bold play. Really <laughs> wild play. Yeah. She should be out here going fuck magic like he he didn't do anything yeah. right because he didn't i'm sure there was a moment where she was like what the fuck i bet like, like privately yeah. but yeah. like publicly she's out here like the godfather with everybody on twitter going mad giving magic slander as an executive she's out here like the godfather look how they massacred my son yeah well fine we massacred him sure he deserved it <laughs> yeah like <laughs> yeah i have no problem with it. like he, he needed to be massacred he got massacred at least he took it like at least he didn't fight back all right, let's move on. Uh, we got a lot of playoff basketball to get to, but before we do that, Game of Thrones premiered its final season. Kevin is not a Game of Thrones watcher, so I'm going to explain a vital plot point of each episode to a guy who does not watch Game of Thrones. I'm going to try to guess things that will it won't work, but we'll try and guess anyways. This episode for the Thrones watchers, uh, if you haven't listened or if you haven't watched yet, spoiler alerts. So skip ahead maybe like I don't know this will probably take a couple minutes. So uh skip ahead a couple minutes if you haven't watched yet cuz spoilers are yeah. inbound. This episode goes down honest to god as one of my least favorite Game of Thrones episodes. I thought it was extremely mediocre. I can't believe they made me wait 2 week 2 years rather for fucking setup and me- like no story development really at all. Tons of fan service. Just very disappointing overall as an episode of this show. But the plot point I want to explain to you and listen to your reaction. Um, there's a character who last season he pledged fealty to her as his queen. And then they had the sex in Usually. a boat. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was a great scene. Um, all of us as viewers were aware that she is in fact his aunt. He in the show is not aware that she is, in fact, his aunt. Tough look. Yeah, not a great thing. Uh, so in this episode, the big twist was at the end, a character was like, hey, me and this other guy put thing, put two and two together. I read a diary, and he's got like a ability to see everything that's ever happened in the history of the world. Professor and, uh, Xavier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. He literally is. He's in a wheelchair. Perfect. He's in a wheel. In the first episode of the series, he gets pushed out of a window and it cripples him for the rest of the series. So now, like he's, six seasons ago, he got pushed out of a window. Yeah. So now he's in a wheelchair. He's a pivotal character with the ability to see everything that's ever happened in the history of the world. See, like that's I don't understand. He's literally Professor X. Of, like it's like it's it's future, but it's past. And there's dragons, but they talk like Americans talk. But with British accents? The dragons don't talk. No, no, no. I mean, like, the characters. Like, they just say normal curse words and, like, like every other, like, it's just normal and dialect, but, like, it's the one, they'll, they'll the say, old times, right? They say cunt a lot, which is more yeah, British. Usually. Yeah, that's true. It is Way more British. British. It's, it just means, like, it's far less offensive if you do it with a British accent, I feel like. Yeah, I think it's, yeah. well, the books were written by an American. I right. think the showrunners are both Americans. Makes sense. But it's all based, like, the books even are all based on, uh, like, medieval England. So it makes sense that it like it's basically if you look at the map of the country it's basically England. I feel like there's just was there that much incest in England back in the day? I don't like, know about the yeah, maybe. I don't know like, about all the incest, but it's the it's, kid who got killed was like a king but like the kid of siblings, right? What? 
But the, what was the... the You're uh, explaining Thrones no, to no, me no. now. The only thing I remember from like way back is like the wedding where the kid died, right? The kid king? Yeah, 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 yeah. And his, his parents were like siblings, right? No. Oh, yeah, okay, so we're thinking of different weddings because there's two weddings where people die. Okay. But, yeah, so the kid king dies at the wedding and his parents, yeah, but no, people don't know that. Like, people now know that in the oh, show, okay. but, like, they didn't really at the time. Okay. Like, they did, but they also didn't. But, yeah, so, like, the theory, the working thing was that her husband, who was the king, was actually her dad or his dad, but actually okay. it was her brother who she was cheating on the king with the whole time they were together. Because the king was getting whores and, and not As kings sleeping do. with right, yeah. and not sleeping with the queen, and the queen was like, "Fuck this! I love my brother anyway." And so she had three kids with him. Web feet and weird defects, or just normal kids? That was just the thing like that, mental health. Like, okay. well, you know, that's about it. Yeah. But so two scenes in this episode that I absolutely loved. One was one of the more ruthless things I'd ever seen, uh, where Daenerys, she's the queen now, the blonde hot girl Khaleesi yes Khaleesi uh, so she goes up to one name. of these characters that one Snow the only names I know uh, yeah so <laughs> they are that's she's his aunt those are the ones <laughs> yeah so now you know <laughs> she's his aunt that's not she's not the one that's like married to a Jonas brother it's the other one right yeah no yeah the other okay. one the one that's yeah. married to the Jonas brothers the redhead yeah. one in the show Sansa she, she's the one that was in Baby Driver was she in Baby Driver? No, I'm thinking of somebody else now. Never mind. That's she was in, like, different. Terminator. Okay, maybe that was it. I but was th- Something. Yeah, so there's one scene where she goes up to this guy, and she's like, uh, hey, I just wanted to meet you or whatever. And he's like, okay, cool. And then he's like, hey, I want to get pardoned. And she goes, what crimes did you commit? And he says something about, well, I stole some books from the old, from the Citadel, and also I stole a sword from my family, the Tarleys. And the Tarleys, she had the dragons fucking kill all of them. And he doesn't know this yet. And so she's standing there. She goes, not Randall Tarley. And he goes, yeah, that's my dad. And uh, she's like, "Uh, he, I asked him to bend the knee and he said no. And so he's like, oh, uh, okay. And he's like, like visibly upset that his dad's dead, but his dad also was a dick and hated him. So at the same time, he's like, well, at least now I'll be able to go home and see my brothers. And she goes, yeah, uh, yeah, about that. they yeah. stood with them. Yeah. And then he's like, fuck. <laughs> and he, run, and he gets really pissed off. So he runs out and he's not happy with her. So he goes to John and he's like, John, if you were King, would you have done what she did? And he was like, I wasn't king. And he's like, but you've always been king. And he's like, what are you talking about? And then he tells him who his real parents are. And then you can see John is like putting it all together. Oh, I just had sex with my aunt. But I don't know if that's the thought that went through his head, but I'm like, that's got to be the thought that's growing through his head. Is uh, Like, because they're in love, too. Like, Sansa even asked him at one point in the episode, she's like, did you uh, pledge to her to be your queen because you really think that she can save us or did you do it because you love her and he doesn't even answer and then sam goes to him and he's like hey dude like she's your aunt and he's sitting there and he's like i'm like he's got to be processing that he's actually king but he's also got to be processing that he's in love with his fucking aunt that's a little weird just a little so that was game of thrones this week weird yeah i mean you know it's a lot to take in uh Okay, I'm ready. I'll, I'll, I might even watch next one. Maybe. Next next week might be pretty exciting. Maybe. Uh, one thing I'll say about Game of Thrones this week, while the episode was mediocre, Game of Thrones Twitter is absolutely on fire with these memes. These Love memes are out of control. I have laughed out loud more times they tonight. They all go right over meme. my head, mostly. But Oh, yeah. man, are they funny. Um, okay, we got to talk playoff basketball. Yay. We're going to start with the Pistons because the other games were fun, and I want to get this one out of the way early. <laughs> Not fun. This fucking sucked. Not fun. This whole thing just Dude, sucked. It's, it was bad. It was very, very bad. What was the final score? It was, uh, it was 120. 121 to 86. Yeah, not great. Yeah, not fun at all. They did win the fourth quarter by one point. We got something to build off of. <laughs> yeah, who was playing for the Bucks in that fourth quarter? No one. <laughs> like Giannis, didn't Giannis have a triple double or a double double in twenty minutes? Yeah, like twenty four and seventeen in like, three quarters. <laughs> he played. He played twenty three minutes. He had twenty four and seventeen. He had he had Thonmaker two fouls deep in like a minute and a half. Poor Thonmaker. 
<laughs> Some oh, makers like, Tom. I'm going to get my revenge. Like, he was two fouls deep man. in a minute and a half. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Like, what are you going to You're trying to guard with Thon Maker? Like, what are you going to do? Not great. You just turn around, put your palms up, look at your coach. Like, what do you want me to do? Not great. He just took one dribble to get from his own three-point line to the other free throw line, and then he dunked from the free throw line. How am I supposed to stop that guy? Not great. Like, that's a real thing that happened tonight. This is just... The Pistons, like two, was it how many weeks ago was it where I got on the show and I said this season has already been a success for the Pistons? That was before they went and fucked the last four weeks of their yeah. season oh, yeah. and dropped themselves to the eight seed yeah. so they could get their ass opened by Milwaukee. It's open. It, it's if like look okay if you watched that Boston Indiana game today, Indiana is really 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 bad. I mean, they looked really, really bad in the second really half. Especially, bad. they got gassed. Yeah. They have Couldn't score. They're at all. they're like they have absolutely zero playoff caliber play without Depot. None. Yeah. It's tough. They suck. The Pistons had an opportunity to play that team in the playoffs. Uh, I mean, the Celtics match up way better with them than the Pistons. Sure. Do. Yeah. But you, the Pistons match up way better with oh, them yeah, than they with, do Milwaukee. Oh, well, they match up anybody better than Milwaukee. Like, it's just, I mean. Which is where, like, I, I was happy to come out here and go, this season has been a success so far. But then Blake fucked up his knee. Now he, Predictable. He, Rather he, predictable really, that would happen. When he, got, when he got traded here, I was like, look, he's going to get injured That's, at some point. That was the main cog in that trade. It's like you, you're relying on the health of a dude who's perennially injured. Guess what? He's hurt, and you're in the playoffs. And he can't he help you. He doesn't think he's hurt. Well, yeah, he yeah. comes out and says that if it were up to him, he would play, and it's a very complex situation. I Now, I pissed off a free press writer, who I will leave nameless, but I made a joke that Dwayne Casey's on the hot seat for this. And I received flames back because Dwayne Casey, of course, is not on the hot seat. He has four years left on his contract. We've got to find a way to get Mike Abdenauer back. There are <laughs> things called yeah, there are things called medical teams that exactly. make these decisions. But it's very odd that Blake Griffin is saying, "If it were up to me, I'd be playing." Is it not up to you in a playoff game? Like this is the Anthony Davis thing, right? Like I don't pick my shirt. He is <laughs> the. Oh, we got to talk Anthony Davis too at some point. But he he is the lone. Well, I know where we'll talk, Anthony Davis. He is the lone all star on this team, the lone star on this team, the lone offensive weapon on this team. He's the only ball handler. Like, and what, you're in, Smith played like you're in a playoff series. Yeah. Now I know you have no hope of winning this playoff series, but at the end of this, it's the off season. It's Cancun, so like Cancun's coming quick. If Blake wants to play in the playoffs, let him play. Blake's got like a design or a bikini designer girlfriend. He probably goes to cooler places in Cancun. Could be. Yeah. Boca Raton. <laughs> the mouth of the rat. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, like, I don't want to spend a ton of time talking Pistons. Yeah. One thing I want to say, it was a bad weekend for the tank crowd. We'll get to it in the next week- in the next game we get to. It's also a really bad weekend for the Pistons should make the playoffs crowd because I'll tell you what, even a low lottery pick feels like it would enjoy it a whole lot more than I enjoyed that game. I mean, the the way the lottery odds were this year, like you had every chance to get in the top ten. I know it's not a deep draft, but like, I mean, you could try. Like, why not? Yeah, and it's. I get that a draft pick isn't a promise, and I also get that like even if they did get a, a lottery pick, it's not going to change their near future by a whole lot. But like this, also, this is their ceiling. So it's kind of like, I don't know if there's a way for Piston fan to be, like, Piston fan can say we should tank, Piston fan can say we should make the playoffs. Either way, I think you're going to end up upset. It wasn't to me, like, it wasn't about tanking. Like, you made a trade I'm in the same boat. You made a trade for a guy who, I mean, there were two reasons for that trade. One, Stan Van Gundy wanted to save his job, and two, Tom Gores wanted asses in the seats. That was why they made that trade. It wasn't because it was like, oh, we're considerably better with Blake Griffin than we are with Avery Bradley and Tobias Harris. To be fair, Avery Bradley sucks. He's played okay when after the Memphis trade. Like he, I mean, in Memphis, but Memphis scraps, man. They try hard. It, also, another coach got fired. Doesn't make any sense, but, you know, Memphis, do you? Uh, I mean, the, the tanking, though, like with the Pistons, it wasn't about tanking. It's just entirely about what's the ceiling with Blake Griffin? And by the way, you're at the ceiling now because it's yeah, only getting this is worse. It. This like, is it. Like you think, like oh, next year they'll be better. They'll get the four. Are, uh, who are they getting? Who's going to help them get the four? That's 
kind of where I was at last week when, when I said Andre Drummond playing this well is not an incentive to keep him. It's actually no, it's, more incentive to trade him. Like, I need him to play better in the playoffs so that people want him. You will never get – and instead he got ejected. Yeah, classic. You, But you will never get higher value for him than you will right now. Because even now they're like, well, he's playing really good. Maybe a change of scenery will be all he needs to take that next step. You could still sell someone on that. Like, yeah. you should because this is your ceiling. Getting beaten by 50 – at Milwaukee in a playoff game is your ceiling. When Kemba bails from Charlotte and Charlotte is stuck needing a point guard and a center, that's when you call. You say, give us all your young guys and we give you Andre and Reggie. Boom. Yep. That's it. Like, make that work. Just be good enough to make that trade happen. Because I can tell you right now, when Kemba dips out of Charlotte, God will, like, Kemba, if you, it, just get the fuck out leave. of Charlotte. Just leave. Get I out. know they could pay you a bunch of money and I know it wasn't, like, a really great contract for you on this last one, but, like... Dude, four for one forty is fine. You'll be okay. You'll eat at the same restaurants as the guy who gets five for one ninety. Get like just leave. Out. And in fact, he might pick up the check. So <laughs> get leave. out. Just leave. Just get out. Uh, yeah. If Kemba leaves Milwaukee, or if Kemba leaves Sh- Milwaukee, if Kemba leaves yeah. Charlotte, they will be the new Atlanta Hawks. They will yep. be the new Bring- pipeline buyout team. Mitch Send Kupchak us your running. salary. Yeah. Give it all. They they that will be who they are, yeah. and that's where you take their young guys. Which, honest to God, Malik Monk could actually be decent. So it's I'm, I'm on Miles, but they same. Won't, you it's won't the same get thing. Miles. Yeah, I don't yeah. think you get Miles yeah. either. But like, if you could, that'd be they'll, incredible. They'll probably want to move Malik because Monk. guess what? You could have fucking drafted yeah, Miles you if you never traded for Blake. You sure could have. So like again, if you can do that, if you can make that happen, where you can ship Drummond and Reggie to Charlotte and get young guys like Malik Monk back, because I think Malik Monk still has upside. You're better off that way because yeah. then you just you turn Blake into the old guy that shoots threes. Or you, you rest Blake. him when he needs to. You move Blake. You can't. They, I don't think you can with the oh, contract. They, they can't do it. Like the, I, I mean, they can do it. They won't do it. It will not be talked about at all. But there is there is definitely a market for Blake Griffin. I think like the, he's going to make third team All NBA. But the but again, he's going to make third team All NBA. But where is he when he when his team needs him most? It's true, but. I mean, if you're not asking him to carry the load for 80 straight games, and maybe he can stay a little healthier. Honestly, hmm. Boston, who knows? Boston might be in the market. Um, That's a lot of money. If, if, yeah, it I is mean, a lot of money for, for a team that... There, there right. are other teams that could do it. Like, I mean, Portland immediately comes to mind if Nurk can't play. If but, money weren't an issue, it yeah. would be... Um, I don't want to again. I don't want to spend a ton of time on the Pistons, but we can get to their offseason stuff in later episodes. Sure. Just... I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. This yeah. is this is what they are. And the people thinking like, well, you have to have Blake because that's how you get other free agents. No, you, you don't get other free agents. It's Detroit. They didn't get Blake as a free agent. Like, it's They sure didn't. And, and now Blake's like, I love Detroit. Blake can tell as many people as he wants that he loves Detroit. They're not going to go to Detroit over Miami and getting or a, yeah, Los getting Angeles. a bunch of free agents doesn't typically work well every single time. Like, Kevin Arnovitz had an awesome piece this week for ESPN about absorbing the culture or absorbing a free agent into a locker room culture and how difficult it is when that guy is as big a persona as one of these. Like, it was phenomenal. Go read it if you can find it. It was amazing. But, like, so many good, like, no, he said no culture can fully absorb an incoming superstar. Not even the Heat could do it with LeBron. And they're the most buttoned up culture in history. Like you can't it's, fully absorb that guy. It's taken the better part of two and a half to three years for the Warriors to fully absorb and accept Kevin Durant. Have they? It, like they're I, fighting on the bench at the beginning of this year. But honest to God, yeah. I think yeah. when he got ejected in that game the other night, yeah. he, that was he's a warrior now. And they might have the best culture, like News. other than the Heat ever. However, like, that continues to roll over because Boogie has been a disaster for the most of the time that he's played this year. He's had some bright I mean like I coming back from an Achilles injury, I'll give him a pass for it, but like yeah, I I mean he, he is at least like He certainly doesn't feel like the fans have accepted him at all, which Those fans are uh, He's an end of bench guy. Again, but it's a in, weird it's a weird parallel for them being the last season in Oracle and like oh we're getting new fans, we're going across. I don't right. know how all that's going on, but like Boogie at the same time like that Denver game, I keep going back to that Denver game every time I think, oh, it works. Because I was just sitting there like, it's not fair that he's out there with them. Like, all five of them were out there. Dur- Durant wasn't even out there. He got thrown out. It was him and Ugudala. And Boogie's out there going 28-12 and 12 on Jokic and hitting the three to make it 30 in the fourth quarter. And I'm like, oh, my God. So let's move on to this game because I think we can yeah. get through it pretty quickly uh, since we're on the topic. There are also games like last night where Boogie's out there with all five of them, and it looks like he's an absolute detriment to all five of good. them. Yeah. Like when when he came off the floor, 
the first quarter was interesting because there was a point where the Clippers were winning like more than halfway into the first quarter. Mm. And then Boogie came out of the game. And then the Warriors did what the Warriors do. Yeah. And then Boogie came back in the game in the second quarter and the Clippers got close again. And then he came out. And then Steph did what Steph does. And then he came back in and it got tight. Then he came out and really never played again. And Steph just went nuts. Steph's stat line from last night. One of the more ago, absurd really Steph's. 38, 15, and 7. 15 rebounds. 38, 15, and 7 on 11 for 16. 38 points on 16 shots. How does that happen? You go 8 of 11 from 3 is how that I, happens. I saw a graphic that like since I think I can't remember the year but I think they said since Steve Kerr got hired in between 30 and 35 feet he shoots 40% and the rest of the NBA is at 28 collectively. My, yeah, that was a wild I, I remember that graphic. I think he, like, he shot what 38 something like that, yeah. Uh the other thing with Steph is how does this guy get so much he doesn't show up in the playoffs talk? And yet he's the all-time leading playoff three-point scorer in 97 games. Did you see the Doc quote after the game? Doc called him one of the most underrated players in the NBA. A a two-time unanimous MVP. (laughs) Called him one of the most underrated players. Like, you still, like, people don't appreciate how ridiculous it is what he can do. The first ever unanimous MVP and one of the most, more decorated and better coaches in the NBA, Doc Rivers, calls him. The one of the most underrated players Championship in the league. coach and a great player, too. It really, honestly, nothing blows my mind more than the Steph Curry doesn't show up in the playoffs when he broke Ray Allen's three-point playoff record right. in half the games. Half. Ray Allen, 172 games. Steph Curry, 97. It's... LeBron James is third on that list in, like, 215. And he's not even a three-point shooter. <laughs> and that's, it. like, what Steph has done... That's the big thing that I take away from this game. The other thing is I think Kevin Durant finally became a warrior. But Finally. Two finals MVPs later. <laughs> final, two finals MVPs in series where he hit the yeah. dagger shot. Twice. Yeah. Finally, he yeah. became accepted as by finally. those fans. Like when he was walking out high-fiving fans after being ejected, smiling after being ejected, after taunting he's, Pat Bev. Like, he taunts him all game, and then he's like in the press conference while wearing a White Sox hat. He's like, nah, he's from Chicago. I get it. I was like... Do you hate him or not hate him? Like you stood over him for no reason and yelled at him. Like he said, what? he's got respect yeah. for. Him. He's like, I respect the way he plays. I played against him in Arkansas. Like, yeah, he's a Chicago kid. I get it. I'm like, what? I don't. You got thrown out. Like you're gonna get fined. Like, <laughs> was it worth it? Like, if you respect him so much, so what the hell are you doing? Like, <laughs> great guy. Love yeah, the guy. Like, yeah, he's, he's really cool. Like, like he, that was one of the funniest KD things. He was just standing over Pat Bev, smiling. No like Ed Malloy got in there so quick and didn't even wait. He's like, yep, both of you go. Like, Which, to be fair, was a really, really soft ejection. Evan Lloyd's got a quick mind. trigger. But it was probably also the right move because it was like, yeah. we know KD is Game's not over. going to let yeah. this go. Game's and just over. like Screw it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, again, not a whole lot to go for, go off with this game, except, look, the Warriors are still the Warriors. Yeah. Steph is still Steph. I don't think Boogie Cousins can play in a final series. Andrew Bogut only played two minutes. Like, they just went small. Like, That's the it, other it's thing. A matchup. Like the, I texted you, and it's one of the more astonishing stats I've ever seen. In a game that the Warriors won by 15 points, Boogie Cousins in 21 minutes yeah. was a minus 17. Yeah, they won by 17, and he was minus 17. Minus yeah. 17 in 21 minutes in a game that they won by 17. 17 points. <laughs> How is that possible? He can't move his feet like that. They got mobile bigs. They got rid of Gortat. It's just Harrell and those guys move like they like. They, I mean, they can match with them fine. They don't need Boogie like. And what you said was exactly, and what you said was perfect. The Hamptons Five is still their best lineup, and it is. It, it never wasn't like there was. It was never a point where anything other than the Hamptons Five has been their best lineup. That's where I look at the Warriors, and I'm like, if you get into a playoff series with a team like Boston in the finals, with a team like Boston, a team like Toronto, Boogie can't see the floor. Like if you're going up yeah, against Milwaukee, Toronto y- maybe. With Gasol. Maybe more, but because yeah. he he spaces the floor too, mm-hmm. it's a little. It gives Boogie more of an opportunity to not play in the paint. They're both very. If immobile. they get Milwaukee, Giannis will murder him. Tough. But yeah, and I, I, I like I haven't paid too much attention to it. I'll watch it next time, but I don't think Boogie's closing out Brook Lopez outside. Like I don't think he has the mobility to be able to do it in that series. So yeah, if they do get Milwaukee. That's a tough look for Boogie. And it's also like if they get Boston, it's the same thing. Because Boston, the last time they played, they were tagging him with Gordon Hayward. And yeah. Gordon Hayward was killing him. 
So I, I just he's a matchup that we've known that from the beginning. Like they'll use him when they need him. I think like, if you get into a finals, but I don't like they used him for 21 minutes last night, and they were 21 really bad minutes. True. So true. I, like Kerr has to commit to this being a matchup. You go out and get Andrew Bogut, only use him for two minutes. Yeah, I mean, do, it, you want to do that against the, Boston or Milwaukee or Toronto? You can't, or you can't. I mean, in the minus 17, like the guy had six turnovers in 21 minutes too. Like not great. It's not like he's holding the ball that much. Like. To turn yeah, it over he's six not, times. He's a not lot coming in the way for, yeah. KD did as yeah. a free agent where he's, he's walking the yeah, ball up the floor. He's not like he don't have the ball enough to turn it over six times in twenty one minutes. How about Draymond though? A little playoff Draymond making shots. Dude was 12, hot from 17 three. Point, 17, seven and seven. When he stepped into a three in the first quarter, and I was like, oh, man, if it, playoff Draymond's That's back. what they said. Like, Draymond, do you like it? The playoffs is like, yeah, my shit goes in now. Like, <laughs> <laughs> love the playoffs. Great quote like, from Day Day. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the next game I want to hit on is one of the more interesting games where I think, like the first round, we always say you don't learn a ton about these teams until the second round. We learned a lot about the Philadelphia 76ers in their first game with Brooklyn. Like, we learned a lot. Charmin ultra soft. Like, soft as can be. Joel Embiid said that when fans boo, players make less shots. I like, th- th- huh? I actually have no words for this. Do this you is... know where you are, like geographically? Do you know what city you play in? Your surprise fans booed. Where who do you? Where do you think you're playing? Like the first thing I said when Bryce Harper signed a 13 year deal with no outs as a Philly. That first O for four, like I and it'll happen. I've seen Mike Trout wear a golden sombrero in Comerica Park. I've seen good players have really it bad happens. days. It happens. That first 0 for 4 game in the summer in Philly in a sold out Citizens Bank. Yeah. Like Giancarlo had that with last year with New York. He'll be getting booed. Yeah. And especially with the money he makes. Yeah. And it's it's like, look, if those fans will chew you up and spit your ass out and they don't care. And I swear, I think they're coming for Ben Simmons. I mean, if he were on a bigger contract, if he weren't on a rookie deal right now, like the amount of hey, I know man, you how can't much shoot would be a lot louder. I know how much they love him. And how much they defend him. After that game and his former playoff performances, this guy turns into a 6'10 Michael Carter-Williams. The game itself was atrocious. The comments after say, if you're going to boo, stay on that side. Like, dude, you play in Philly. It only made it worse. Like, Amir Johnson looking at his phone on that's, the bench. That's you, not I mean, great. What do you think Jimmy Butler said right away when he found that out? And I, like, What was the immediate reaction to being like Amir Johnson was, was on his phone on the bench and so was Joe? He... he pointed at six guys that we don't even know the names of that have limited involvement with the 76ers organization. He said, I'm taking you, yep. you, you, He was and looking you. around for Josh Akogi again. He was like, all right, let's go get him. <laughs> <laughs> he would took, he's like, Ben, Joel, right there. Yeah. We're going. Like, I mean, a wild day in Philly. Like, uh, just a wild day. Here's the other thing. Jo- Jimmy Butler had an incredible game. He did. I can't remember his final shot line. Thirty six on twenty two shots. What was his, what was it? Oh, it was eleven uh, to twenty two. Eleven to twenty two. Thirty six nine. Thirty six and nine rebounds. Thirteen of fifteen at the line. So Jimmy Butler was eleven to twenty two. The rest of the team and he was, was hustling too. The rest of the team was twenty four of sixty four. Yeah, I mean JJ was like he, like he couldn't find a lot of shots. Like JJ, I mean I know he fouled out, he get trouble. Like but. I, I guess you can chalk it up to that. Like, he couldn't find a rhythm, and shooters don't like to get in foul trouble, but this is what everybody said. Who's J.J. Reddick guarding? And it wasn't Karis LeVert. He tried. Didn't work. <laughs> Karis like, LeVert had himself a game. D'Angelo Russell, once he got into the rhythm of the off and the rhythm of the game, mm-hmm. like, I think the first half, the lights were a little big for him, and, like, the stage was kind of, He's in first playoff game. Yeah, for sure. It was a little big. He's on the road. Second half, when he got into a rhythm, when he started like feeling the flow of the game, he was hot. How about like the unsung hero for all eternity, Ed Davis? Oh, man, Ed he was working Davis. the glass. On what? He 1. was incredible on the glass. That Portland wouldn't match? Yeah, yeah. and he's, he's out here yeah. throwing a body at Joel Embiid on the offensive glass. The it was Hold unreal. Okay. So Ed Davis's final stat line, 12 and 16 boards on 5 for 7 in 25 minutes. Joel Embiid. In game one versus the Nets, guarded by anyone not named Ed Davis, 15 points on 4 for 7 shooting over 1 from deep. Guarded by Ed Davis, 7 points on 1 for 8 and 0 for 4 from deep. Embiid, and this has always been my problem, I've said it, Embiid is a guy where if you find the right matchup, especially in a playoff series, 
you can severely limit his his out. I mean that that was the right matchup in game one. Ed Davis owned him, and it may now they may ride Ed Davis for the rest of the series. And it's like, but it's the same thing where you look at the the, when the Celtics play him, and it's Aaron Baines. Like Aaron Baines, you kidding me? He is the kryptonite for Embiid in the playoffs. Like how many teams has Aaron Baines been on? (laughs) A million. Ed Davis literally like Portland said no to a one point four million dollar contract this year. They're like, nope, go ahead, go to Brooklyn, and it pissed off Dame. It made their superstar mad, and they still did it. Yeah, that's how much they didn't care about Ed Davis. So great tweet because I think like we're going to talk a lot about the Amir Johnson thing. This was a great tweet from Kevin O'Connor. Amir Johnson looked at his phone during the game, but that story will fade in a day. What matters is Philadelphia's lumbering star center, the tall guard who hasn't produced in the playoffs at all, the leaky perimeter defense, the lack of depth, and this is the biggest one to me: the coach's unstructured offensive system and defensive system. I, I mean, e- either way, like, you well, have 111 it, points at home in a playoff game. That's a lot of points at home in a playoff game but to a like, team playing their first playoff game in years. Sure, but again, like, we keep talking about their defense is going to be an issue. The yeah. defense is a real worry. Jimmy Butler actually played okay defensively, which I wasn't totally expecting. Once the pick and roll started moving a little better for Brooklyn, he, he kind of got exposed. Mm-hmm. But the offense really shocked me with how bad it was. And it was like... I've always known, like when it comes to the playoffs with Philly, and it's why you kept saying I, you have all this faith in them all season. You've been saying it, mm-hmm. and all season I've been like, I kind of just got to see it. Like I know it's a different team, but I got to see it. To me, it's a lot of star power, but it's still you have two guys who can shoot. That's it. It's true. Well, you have yeah, you have yeah, Tobias yes. Harris who is above league average. You have JJ Redick who's a good shooter. That's it. JJ Redick's a great shooter. Right. And but, Jimmy can kind of shoot. But he's below league average, yes, especially is. from deep. And it's yes, he, is. he has nice shot. He had the buzzer beater in this game. Many. Yeah, from deep. Yeah. But it's it's like you have two guys who can really shoot. Mm-hmm. You have Embiid who is a top five to top ten player in this league when he's playing his best, but he's always hurt this time of year. And he always wants to play, even when he shouldn't, like he you game know one. A, a really harsh reality that Elton Brand's gonna have to face. He gave up way too much for Tobias Harris. Yeah, way too much. I mean, Landry Shim, it would help them immensely right now. Mike Muscala like, yeah. might help them. Like anything, any kind of shooting, any kind of length. Like he just gave up way too much for Tobias Harris. The thing too with Landry Shamit, like the the problem with Tobias Harris. And I'm is, not knocking the trade. Make the trade, but I'm saying sure. like, you gave up a lot. I love Landry Shamit. I think he's a really good player. He's been starting for the Clippers, and he's been playing yeah. really well. He's got a nice outside shot. Like he just knows how to play, and he has a nice outside shot, yeah. which is something that. that the Sixers really badly need. I love Tobias Harris. You're, when it comes to like, are we going to keep Tobias Harris or are we going to keep Jimmy Butler? Whatever you gave up for either of them was too much. Mm-hmm. Because I mean, the, the Butler deal is pretty good. Like Covington's been right. hurt all year. Sarge wasn't that great, right? Like, and that's where, like, I almost think they their best bet would have been we have Jimmy Butler. Let's ride this out instead of mm-hmm. going all in and getting Tobias Harris. Because when they did that. They were all in. Yeah. And now I look at this, and I tweeted it the other day, and I look at this, and I go, the process has really left you with nothing more than a star-studded starting lineup, zero depth, and you have to face the harsh reality that you can only pay one or the other of Jimmy Butler and Tobias Harris this summer, and you're staring down the barrel of having to give Ben Simmons a rookie max extension. Not even. I mean, they said they were going to do it. Like Elton Brand has on record multiple times saying it's not even a negotiation. We're offering that. Ben Simmons has now had a career where he has what did he have in this game? Nine points total, nine point seven rebounds and three assists on one for five from the free throw line, four for nine from the floor. Dude, you're turnovers. you're a top fifteen, top ten player. You it, have to be better than legitimate that. Legitimate consideration for all NBA this year. You have to be yeah. better than that. This is a guy who last year had a one point game in a game two loss against the Celtics. Kyle Lowry didn't score at all. <laughs> like these are yeah, and we'll get to that. But it's like when I look at Ben Simmons, he's good in the regular season. He's he's not as good as he could be if he had even a mid range shot. And I think like you go or to the playoffs, game, like a post game, how like just an area on the floor where yeah. you can score other than just attacking the basket off the bounce from twenty feet. And like maybe learn to cut. When you don't something. have the ball in your hand, like something like be be an active screener. Yes, yeah, like, like anything other than yes. being a ball dominant guard. When you really should be a power forward and be an off ball type player, yeah. 
and learn to shoot from the corner or learn to, something. Learn to let Jimmy Butler snake a pick and roll. Like, yes. Like just, just do something that like is a basic NBA maneuver for somebody who moves like he does at 6'10". But I think the fact that he's a 6'10 guard and exclusively guard, he's really good defender. Oh, yeah. Really good really defender. Good. And you will never, like the stat that I think it was on mixtape, and the stat was that he's the only player who's defended 10% of the opposing possessions at each position, at, like at least 10% of the opposing possessions at each position. I it. And he's also being the only player to do that. And he's also kept each of those under their average production. Like he's an incredible defender. I mean, athletically, he's he's a freak. He's Giannis style athletically, like not quite to that degree, but he's also younger. I don't know about how much. I always get Giannis. Giannis is like, is like yeah, 24. 24 years old. Like that's nuts. But Simmons like six ten to be able to move like that, and he's a better ball handler than Giannis is. Like Absolutely. without a doubt, and a world's better passer. Not even close. Like, yeah. But it's again like you need to have a sh- you need to be able to do something mm-hmm. else and that's where i think like they're going to give him this rookie max extension they're going to commit to ben simmons then he has to commit to figuring out a jump shot because otherwise he's always just going to be an overpaid overrated it just like i don't think he's winning anything you cannot now. allow yourself as a player of ben simmons caliber to be guarded by karis levert like cuz he took him out like all he did, he's just and sitting on him. There's no lanes to pass it, and it's like you can't let that guy take you out defensively. The Simmons sag has even it's real, it's very real. It's extremely real because yeah. Karis Levert was playing yeah, six way feet, off seven him. feet off way of him, off him, and it got to a point where Karis Levert was interrupting and disrupting his passing yeah. lanes because he was so far. There was a point Tobias Harris cut towards the rim. Ben made went to make a pocket pass, but because Karis was sagging so yeah, much, eight feet away from him, he like, just picked it off easily. And it's like that's where you need to develop a shot. And I think without that, this team really, the process is going to end up looking lackluster. And that's why I said it's a bad weekend for the tank crowd because Philly, look, they started tanking. They revolutionized tanking. Look Trust what it's process. turned into. Nothing. I mean, like, I think there's a very real chance that Brooklyn wins this series. And you might disagree, but I really think no, there's I mean, a real if you're chance. you're up one nothing, that means it's a real chance. I still, like, I don't put too much onus on one game. I never do. Like, I mean, they lost a game at home in the first round last year, and they won in five. Like, I don't think they win this series in five. I don't think so either. But And I thought it was seven mean, to start with. Last year. I thought it was a seven-game series to start, and... Like, I had Philly winning in seven. I think the fact that they'll play game seven at home is a huge factor. I honestly don't know how much of a factor, like, being away from Philly is going to be if they're in Brooklyn. Like, there's probably going to be a lot of Philly fans. But if Philly fans are booing them for over That's missed true. shots. That's true. Maybe, maybe they'll root for the Nets. No, I, like, I really, and the way D'Angelo Russell was able to come into his own in that second half, the it's way awesome. Ed Davis was able to eat the boards, they kind like, you can, you can at me all you want if you hate this take. They kind of remind me of the Celtics a year ago. In ways. They don't have near as much like high-profile young talent. It's but, not as high-profile, yeah. but I think it, they can play I mean, as high above their ceiling as the Celtics. Zach Lowe play. said yesterday, like, this is so now, or excuse me, not out of the realm of possibility if you just factor, like, if Levert had not gotten hurt at the beginning of the year, the idea of him scoring 23 in a playoff game is normal because he was sure. having that type of year. Absolutely. So, like, okay, he's starting to get back. This isn't, this isn't out of the ordinary. These guys are good. Like, these guys are mm-hmm. really good players. Adilo, really good player. Absolutely. Like Jared Allen. If Jared Allen can avoid getting into foul trouble yeah. against Embiid He's, early. Embiid can eat him right now. He's got to put some more weight on. Definitely. But years. it's that's yeah. where, like, it, I don't need you to defend Embiid that closely. Like, yeah. you can let Embiid eat because he will eat you Embiid alive. Embiid spent most of that game around three-point line to three-point line. But if Jared Allen, and which was the last thing that he should be doing. Yeah. Like, there was way too many times where the Sixers came down and immediately went to Embiid at the top of the three point mm-hmm. line as their first Trailer option three. as a scorer. Yep. And that you can't do that. But that's where, like, if Jared Allen can stay out of foul trouble, mm-hmm. I think you already have another weapon late in the game. And I joked last week about, like, their playoff experience being Damari Carroll. He was great. Look, Spencer Dimwitty yeah. had an yeah. incredible game. Yeah. I think these, like, this is a good team. Absolutely. And it's, it's funny because well they, coached. they re, like, they rebuilt kind of the same way. They got 
absolutely fleeced by the Celtics. They are so lucky that they swung and missed on restricted free agents, though, because they could be oh, paying yeah. Tyler Johnson and Otto Porter so much money right now. Oh, yeah, they're very <laughs> lucky. Uh, but it's, again, like, they got fleeced by the Celtics. They were kind of strapped and handicapped in their yep, rebuild. They had to go after restricted guys. They're more the process than, I think, even Philly is, and it has paid off. Yeah, because at least Philly had a million draft picks. They also got yeah. really lucky that they were they had a trade where they took on money in Timothy Mozgov, and it turned out to they're to paying Dwight turn, Howard this year. Yeah, like they turned a Timothy Mozgov salary eating trade into All Star D'Angelo Russell. I mean, they've done it with like, I mean, how many minutes Alan Crabb did not play? He's inactive. You know how much money that guy makes? Like they took him. He on was one of their best players like, a year ago. Yeah, like they they just take on these guys. We get rid of the money, and all of a sudden now, oh, summer we have cap space and young talent. Come on to Brooklyn. Yep, I think. I think Brooklyn's a more interesting destination than the Knicks this summer, and I think that it's time we really start talking about it. It would be, but it's the Knicks. Like it's Manhattan. It's like that. That's the des- the destination itself is like oh, come save. Like the the type of free agents that Brooklyn wants. Like I guess everybody would want, but like the type that they're really going to go after, the guys that fit the Tobias Harris's, the Kemba Walkers, maybe, probably not. They're pretty loaded at guard, but like those type of guys. They're what not about the Jimmy ones that Butler? the Knicks. I, I keep hearing Jimmy to LA. I have this weird inkling that Jimmy's going to LA, but at him the and same LeBron time, together would yeah, be a blast. It would be something else, man. I'll tell you what. But I still think Brooklyn's not really in the market for a Kevin Durant. Brooklyn's not really in the market for those guys the Knicks are really going after. And I think like people are now well, Chris saying, Middleton. Sure. If if Milwaukee even can't a Brogdon, him, yeah, something. Uh, There's but, a lot of free agents in Milwaukee. And this people year. people are now saying. Kyrie Irving to the Nets? No. Which is like, you you just got a playoff point, or an all-star point guard. What are you going to go get Kyrie for? Yeah. Uh, just I let D'Lo cook. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next game I want to talk about, another one of the more interesting games of the weekend, Toronto and Orlando. DJ Augustine, man. DJ Augustine with the game of his career, one of the OGs, uh, one of the guys that is probably your favorite player's favorite player. Best player on that Texas team. <laughs> That Durant guy didn't matter at all. But, like, I I get that, and that's yeah. funny, but it's also, like, I'm serious. He's probably your favorite player's favorite player. He's one of those guys that's Journey just, man, like, just really well-liked around yeah. the league. I liked him in Detroit. I mean, they were terrible with him, but he was, you know... Even in Chicago, hard. he yeah. was all right. And he it's hard. Yeah, he, yeah, he wasn't great, but he played hard. And now, in Orlando, he's, like, cut out a role for himself. 25-6 and six on 9 for 13 and 4 for 5 from deep in a playoff game. Pretty just good. Owned Kyle Lowry. By the way, he yeah. hit the shot at the buzzer yeah. that won it, and he hit another good. one right before it. Like, yeah. yeah, like he was in Kyle Lowry. Look at Kyle Lowry stat line and then score. The other like, thing, yeah, Kyle Lowry. We we'll get to Kyle yeah. Lowry, but as while well, we're on the Magic, Nico Vucevic does not have a super impressive stat line from this game. No, he was a problem in mm-hmm. this game. He was absolutely it's been a problem all year. He was yeah. absolutely effect, but it's it's like one of those things where somebody will look at the box score and they'll be right. like, "Ah, oh, Vucevic didn't do shit." If you watch that game, he was impacting Orlando's play and he was causing problems Aaron Gordon for too. Toronto. Aaron Gordon had a terrible stat line. He was like, yeah, ten and ten on three for ten, but he was great for them. He did have a really nice clutch corner three late in the game, though. So Timely you got to give him credit for that. Jonathan Isaac played forty minutes in that game, just switching on bigs. Switching on to everything the whole game. Like, they weren't even asking him to shoot, even though he hit five for 10. They and just left him open. Again, you win that first game on the road, you steal home court advantage. And it's that plays huge. I think it plays bigger for Brooklyn than it does for Orlando because I just think Orlando's going to get worn out in this series. Yeah, I mean, they asked Jonathan Isaac to play 40 minutes. I really think it's going to be a five game yeah. series, more than likely. Could Four in a row maybe, is tough. maybe, maybe one more. six. Yeah. But like, Philly, Brooklyn, I'm convinced is going seven. Yeah, I'm starting to get there. Toronto, Orlando, I'm pretty sure is going to be over in five or six. It's so hard to call it after one. Like after two games, I think you have more of a view. But like the way yeah. Brooklyn won and the way Philly lost, it, it's right. it makes it a little different for me. The, Same to, with Denver for me. Toronto, Orlando, I think Orlando can ride this energy a little bit, especially getting like the buzzer beater out of DJ Augustine. I think they might come out hot. Uh, when do they play? Tuesday. Whenever they play, the scheduling so. so weird. Like the it's Boston, like the Celtics played today, and now they play Wednesday. It's weird. Um, I wonder if Brooklyn even stayed in Boston. You think they just went home or uh, Indiana? No, I doubt they went home. Two days off, like. But that's it's. You're gonna go home, then come back, and then go back home. It's I mean, it's. We got private flights. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, 
but again, like just for Toronto Orlando, I thought it was a really cool story for DJ Augustine. Mm-hmm. I thought it was interesting because I think it exposed some of Toronto's weaknesses a little bit. If you right. have a disruptive big man, I think you can cause problems in their half court offense. It's like it's going to be a lot on Nick Nurse to figure out how that fits with Surge and Mark. Yeah, like just picking the right matchups. I think it's something that could definitely come into play in a potential Eastern Conference Finals. It, like if they go up against Milwaukee, I think Giannis is going to be really problematic for them, which he's going to be really problematic yeah, for anyone. He's, he's but Giannis. Toronto, especially, I think, just on the defensive end in the half court, I think he will really disrupt what they want to do. Mm-hmm when they go through their bigs, even when they go to Kyle Lowry or Van Fleet outside, like Giannis is capable of being that disruptive. I think that's something I saw with them, at least in this game. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is just, man, oh man, what are we going to do with Kyle Lowry? That's, uh, that's as rough a game one as you can have pretty much, especially after all the talk that this year would be different. There were articles coming out. There was a lot about Kyle Lowry's going to change the narrative, and then you go 0 for 7, 0 for 6, and 0 for 2 at the line. Like, you couldn't even get a free throw? The most frightening thing for me with Toronto, and I'm at a point, if Brooklyn really does beat Philly, I think Toronto has a walk to the Eastern Conference uh, Finals. If Philly comes easy, back and wins this yeah. series, like in, in, a, in 5 or 6, if Philly just asserts their dominance and wins this... I think it's going to be really tough for Toronto to get out because Embiid is another guy that can really cause problems and for their lineup. Get, you might want to sit Embiid for a game if you're feeling right I'm with like, that. Honestly. I'm definitely with that. And I think you can go down 0-2 and yeah. then Embiid comes back fully healthy and you're more comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, like I just I don't know that Toronto goes anywhere because I think at this point, you st- all this talk about we have Kawhi now, we have Nick Nurse now, we have Danny Green now. It's a totally new team. There's no more I DeMar. I picked him out of the East last week. It's a it's a new culture. The noise, even after one game, Boy, I bet it didn't feel new for those fans. Yeah, <laughs> even after one game, I think the noise in the locker room. Kyle Kawhi, Lowry and Kawhi, Fred Van Fleet are hearing it, especially Kawhi played well. Like he, he played well. Van for Fleet the most played part. really yeah. well too, to be fair. But it, like those two are just the two that stand out as they were here mm-hmm. a year ago. Yeah, and it's like Kyle Lowry, especially. I think it's going to get really loud. Same old Toronto. I mean, Pascal Siakam, we talk about guys who played a lot of minutes. Pascal Siakam played 42 minutes because they don't have OG. Like, yeah. So Pascal Siakam taking 24 shots and, and that's, going 0 for 4 from deep hurts. You said it wasn't huge losing OG. I agree for this series. Right. But losing OG in the long run is you're going to put a lot of miles on Siakam that you probably didn't want to in a first-round series. Yeah, I mean, you, you didn't want to play Jody Meeks. I know he only played three minutes, but you didn't want to have to play Jody Meeks in that game. And the fact that they are missing... OG Ananubi and the fact that they're missing even Patrick McCaw because they needed guys who can be disruptive defensively and they didn't really have that. Right. And I think now it's like I said, like I just think the noise is going to turn up that all the changes in Toronto, it's the same old Toronto. Mm. It might be. I I hope not because again I picked them last week, but it might be. I, I I still like I the same thing I've been saying for all these series. It's so hard to judge everything off one game. I can't think DJ Augustine's going to have 25 on 9 for 13 again. No, and I that's, can't think Kyle Lowry's going to have another offer. Again, that's why I think Toronto's going to have no problem getting out of this series. I just this game 1, I feel like we learned a little bit about this team in game 1 because we saw what a disruptive big can do and we saw what Kyle Lowry looks like Give after Steve all Clifford that. Steve Clifford a lot talk. of credit. Steve Clifford had them game planned the yeah, whole way. Absolutely. Like, he was out coaching Nick Nurse. No doubt. Which nobody really should be shocked by because no, it's coach. Nick Nurse's first playoff game too. And so it's a different experience. But again, I just the talk about this team is what's going to scare me. Mm-hmm. And I think like you the players can say, the coaches can say, everybody can say, We aren't hearing it, we aren't listening to it, we're a different team. It's going to get loud at some point. I bet it's loud. I bet right now. I bet it's yeah, loud right yeah. now because you just lost to a seven seed. Yeah. And there's at home a, in game one. There's another two seed that shares that, but the difference is this two seed lost to a seven seed that has Greg Popovich. And like really good players, like yeah. historic all stars. Like, yeah. I mean, DeRozan wasn't this year, but Aldridge was. Aldridge, like, like Aldridge, if he had this season in most other seasons, would be an all NBA candidate. Like also, Jamal Murray, meet Derek White, have fun. Oof. Oh, like, all right. The, before we start really talking about this game, 17 points on 24 shots for Jamal Murray. Paul Millsap got to retire. Derek White. Paul Millsap, 
Derek like, White ended this man's career in it was, one. It was dunk. a tough look, but Paul Millsap actually played okay in that game. Other than that specific man, moment, man, he's got to yeah. retire. Yeah, I'm telling you, that I was mean, a career that was, ending. That was a dunk. tough look. How about was it Tory Craig who almost dunked on Bertans and treated it way like, uh, like it no, was it was the best Beasley. Dunk. Yeah, Beasley. It was Beasley yes. that almost dunked, Beasley, and he was, was he was they flexing, were hyping him. Jamal Murray was pushing him. I'm like, he's got two free throws, man. Like, what? Is, what the hell's going on? Like, go shoot the damn free throw. He missed he didn't do the anything. dunk. Like, like yeah, why are you this anything. hype? It's a foul. It's a good foul. Like, that's really it. Yeah. It was a like, great foul. Like, at if him? anyone like, should be hype, it should be who would who, who was it? Aldridge that went up for it. Bertans. Oh, but yeah, yeah. it was Bertans. So, yeah, so, yeah so, like what a Bertans, statement you made dunking on Davis Bertans. Bertans should Guy's be the like one a that's three point percentage leader. Great foul. Not there to block. Like Beasley's walking around flexing, getting. I'm like, dude. Derek White just absorbed Paul Millsap's soul, and Derek he wasn't White even as excited. Had a phenomenal basketball game, and also watching Bryn Forbes play Gary Harris in a playoff game is giving me so much nostalgia. Uh, that game, <laughs> like down the stretch, just that was one of the most Gareth fun Harris. games of the weekend. Down the stretch, the shot making from San Antonio down the stretch was definitely. I thought like, the last minute was a little shitty because. Demar tried to choke, and then Jamal Murray did choke, and then Demar tried to choke again. Right. And like I thought that was a little rough. But other than that, I thought the stretch of that game was fantastic. I thought the game overall was fantastic. The, the tweet for me, another Zach Lowe one, two references today for you, Zach. Big day for you. Tracking data via spe- second spectrum has Denver running 0-0 zero, zero Jokic and Murray pick and rolls with Jokic's ball handler in the game one. And that was the most effective pick and roll alignment in the league this season. They didn't run it a single time. Yikes! Got some bad like, news, boys. <laughs> Mike Malone, what happened? Like, I, why? How do you not at least fall ass backwards into that in forty-eight minutes? That's another thing I wanted to touch on too. The end of that game, Mike Malone called timeout and drew up one of the worst. It was a tough ATO like, plays yeah. I have ever seen. It was a tough one. I can't even describe. I know that it involved running into a double team. That most coaches would understand there will be a double team in this position if we run this play. Yeah. And the way that Mike Malone drew it up was just run the ball right into what, it. That ATO at the end of the Toronto game wasn't very good either. Like Kawhi took a terrible shot. Or it looked like it could have been a good shot, but he airballed. Either way, tough ATO night for both those guys. Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, but San Antonio, as far as this, the rest of the series goes, I think San Antonio is a very good shot. For sure. Of all of the upset one O's right Team, now. Teams wanted to finagle their way into that seven. Yeah, of all like, of the lower seed one nothings right now, Brooklyn and San Antonio have the best shot to me. Mm-hmm. San Antonio is the best shot. Yeah, I mean, San like yeah, Greg Popovich. I mean, he He's did. used to doing yeah. the upsetting. He does, he does things like this. Uh, I don't know that they'll go any further because no, I think the shoot. second round still is just can't shoot. really like, hard. Yeah. It, like they still like they don't can, shoot th- but they like, don't they, shoot threes. But they don't. Yeah. Like that's the thing. They they have one of the highest three point percentages in the league. They just don't but do like, it. Low key, they're going to have one of the best under twenty five backcourts in the NBA next year. Derek White, oh, and Dejounte yeah. Murray. Like, oh good yeah. Good luck scoring on those guys. Those guys are going to kill guards next year. That's where the Demar thing is. Like you almost don't even need him. I mean, play the three. Like play the three and bring Rudy Gay off the bench. Do whatever you want. Like I, those two guys are going to be the best defensive backcourt in the NBA next year if Murray comes back healthy. The only thing that gave me pause. There's a lot of things that gave me pause with Denver. I think Jokic got. Exposed a little bit again, uh, offensively even bad scoring night. I mean, Murray seventeen points on twenty two shots or yeah, twenty four shots, whatever the hell it was. Not like, ideal. No, uh, and I think, but the thing with San Antonio, Demar didn't have a great night either, no. and he like he's either going to have to defer to Aldridge and guys like Dejounte Murray and guys like Derek White, or he's going to have to start making his shots. Aldridge doesn't have it easy in this series. Like they got bigs in Denver. Like Jokic can guard him, Millsap can guard him, Plumlee can, can play Jokic him a little guard bit. Him at, can Jokic down guard low, anyone? Down low, he can. Like Aldridge doesn't move his feet all that fast, and Jokic has no, got fair. the wingspan on him and a lot of pounds. That's fair, and especially in the mid range, it could mm-hmm. cause an issue. It did cause an issue a little bit. Aldridge did not have a great mid range game, no. uh, but that's where this is a mid range team. Denver can limit their mid range offense a little bit, so that is worrisome. But overall, I like I picked San Antonio to win this series ahead of time. I think I'm sticking with San Antonio to win this series, especially going up one nothing. It's uh, I have more confidence in them than Denver right now. Yeah, for sure. All right, Boston, Indiana. I think. Oh, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> like I think. They, I think it just the bloodbath. Yeah, Boston got the second easiest matchup in the Eastern Conference outside of Milwaukee. I mean, uh, but, but give them credit though. Like, I mean, yeah, maybe they got an easy matchup. Like, I thought their defense would really suffer without Marcus Smart. Well, they held him under eighty. 
Yeah, like, it, was, I, it was some of the most inspired suffocating. defense I've seen like, played from Jalen. Phenomenal. The th- this Luke is diving for balls. The Celtics are going to the finals. Yeah, I'm I saying it. For. Here we go. I'm <laughs> saying it. No, it, uh, no, but really, um, I looked at this game and I was like, "That's Brad Stevens in the playoffs." Looked, it, it was. Like, it was convincing. I was ready to just the first half. I was furious because the Celtics have one of the worst second quarters in my memory. Mook was hitting shots. I felt good in that first half. Yeah, tell you, I was like, nice. "No, Mook makes shots in the playoffs." Wait no, for it. November like, Mook. Yeah. That was nice. Uh, Kyrie even came out after the game and he was like, "Look, that was probably the worst offensive first half we've had a tough one. all year." Uh, the second half, not still not great offensively. They scored, I think, forty eight points. Can you explain the Jalen Brown push to me? I still don't get it. Why did he push him? I don't know. Like, why not? But like, they, nothing it, happened. There were no elbows before. I didn't see anything. All of a sudden, he just pushed him in the back. I was like, why did you do that? The I, game's over. There's four minutes left. You could have got thrown out for that. I thought that the I thought that the Bleacher Report tweet was the best. It was uh, Jalen Brown just shoved Bojan, and there was no other context. It was just Jalen Brown just shoved Bojan. Welcome to the playoffs. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> Uh, this was some trademark 2018 Boston Celtics playoff defense, except they also had Kyrie Irving and Gordon Hayward. I mean, Kyrie still in the post game interview saying that he has to lead everyone. I mean, I was like, can you just not? Can you? Can we just have playoff? Just say we played not up to par today, and we still won. We'll be better next time. Let's move on. Not. It's just about growing. We just got to mature. Like you're not saying that about you. You're saying that about them. And it still bugs me. So, like, I still have that inkling in the back of my head that they're going to implode at some point. If one loss happens, they're all going to start yelling at each other again. Like, it's always smooth after a win. Maybe that throws a wrench in it. I still think they're going to roll Indiana. Like, I'm not concerned about that. I really just, I think that now that they're in the playoffs, they're just going to talk about basketball. I That's what I, was my inclination. But then he immediately says, we just got to mature. We just got to keep growing up. We just, like... You're not saying that about you. Why do you keep and saying these I things? I think he just has to stop talking. He, right? But just the, stop. The one good thing is at least he came out and said, look, I've not been good at handling right. this, and I'm sorry about right. it. Like, it's my fault. And yeah, <laughs> props to him because it, thank God he said it. Mm-hmm. Uh, somebody needed to, and but I'm he glad it was him. out and saying these things. But I'm okay with it at this point. Like, it, he's it's playing well. It's fine after a win, right? It's absolutely fine after a win. Sure, and he's Especially playing well, kind of and yeah, a, a win yeah. where he was really impactful, especially mm-hmm. defensively. He played the best defense he's ever played he in his career. He only had to play like two minutes in the fourth quarter. Like he came off the bench, hit a three, and then took him back out. He played the best defense he has ever played in his career today. It was great. It was incredible. Jalen Brown played the best defense he has ever played in All, his career today. Everybody played great. It was Bands incredible. Great. It was inspired, and it was like that was a performance where Marcus Smart was watching that with tears in his eyes. <laughs> I'll miss him. Like playoff basketball is a lot more fun with Marcus Smart. Just getting into scraps, flopping sometimes, just doing things that make people mad. Like Patrick Beverly of the East. You know what's going to be a really fun storyline? Last year when Marcus Smart came back in Game 5 to beat Milwaukee, yeah. this year when Marcus Smart comes back in Game 5 to beat Milwaukee, it's going to be a fun. really fun storyline. Nico Guardianis? Yes, <laughs> I, I do. do. I do too. <laughs> like, Don't think it'll be Jason Tatum. Well, the who thing is, also very good. Last year, Shemi Ojale guarded Giannis in the playoffs and did a really good job. Mm-hmm. And this year, in one of the matchups that they played, Shemi guarded Giannis mm-hmm. and did a really good job. He Shemi today. One of my favorite tweets was in the post game. Uh, he was doing his usual medicine ball routine because he's just this ridiculous weightlifting strength oh, yeah. god. Like not even linebacker, he's like a DN. Yeah, and he's doing this weightlifting routine, but they said it was extra loud. And Mook was in the middle of a post game interview, and he stopped and looked and said, "God damn, Shem." So my hope is that they're just like creating this god in the Ojale factory just, just leaving for the Milwaukee series. Wait for Giannis. Yeah, where he will just showcase this outrageous strength defending I, like, Giannis. I still remember Blue Madness semi Ojale when he was a freshman at Duke getting introduced, and I was like, "Who the hell is that guy?" Yeah, like he's just flying through the air, dunking. Future uh, SMU yeah, Mustang and left <laughs> right away. Him and Alex Murphy were like, "Yeah, we're out of here." <laughs> Uh, one of the more fun games of the weekend, OKC in Portland. It was a very good game. Very good game. It was really good. Like, and Ennis Kanter making... At the start, you, it didn't look like it would be really no. good. But Dame and CJ and Russ being Russ and just doing things that don't make any sense. If Paul George had a shoulder... Yeah, or either shoulder. Yeah. yeah. I think OKC would have won this game. 
Also, if Billy Donovan weren't just the most perplexing... I, I told you, Billy Donovan just baffles me, dude. His game like, plan makes no sense. He's still such a college coach. And I want to give... He thinks the clock's going to stop every four minutes for a timeout. It's like, dude, you have seven of them. Yeah. What are you, what are you doing? Like, the clock doesn't stop every four minutes. I want to give credit where credit is due because Portland played really well. CJ is clearly healthy. CJ, by the way, with the tweet of the weekend, that was for you, yes, Jennifer. That was phenomenal. Royce Young asking the question in the press conference. That was amazing. Yeah. Uh, it, that was for you, Jennifer. My favorite moment of the weekend. But, again, like, OKC could have won this game. Yeah. Enos Cantor, at a couple times, just got absolutely beaten off the block, off ball, by by Steven Adams. Obliterated. And giving Adams open lanes to the to the hoop, and I just kept watching it and going, why isn't Donovan calling that up every other trip? Ennis Canner, like to his credit, he did get beat a lot, but he just kept going. Like he, that dude plays hard too. That's another one that yeah, dude just absolutely. plays hard. My thing with it is, if you have Adams consistently beating him off the block, off ball, and he's making these cuts to the rim, somebody has to drop to help. Stephen Adams is a very underrated passer. Like yeah. very under, he can pass out of the post, and it's a, like if if Adams is getting a positioning a position cut where he's closer to the basket, somebody has to drop to help. If he if he's in the post, somebody's dropping to help. It creates open shots. Part of it is Alfaro Camino is such a great help defender, like such a great help defender. True, but again, it, that it's creating open shots, mm-hmm. and that's where like I don't know that Billy Donovan understand understands how NBA spacing works. He's another one. Didn't you just get a contract extension? Yeah, or something like that? for yeah, some right. reason. Like, I far be it from me. That's another guy the Lakers should have called a Sam Presti. But like, most of his moves work. So I guess whatever. But I don't think you're winning anything with Billy Donovan as your head coach. I, I just not in the NBA. No, like exactly. you want to go back to Florida, yeah. cool, bro. <laughs> like you might win another yeah. Natty, but not in the NBA. Yeah, why didn't UCLA call Billy Donovan? They should have, like, yeah. and get him out of Portland or Seriously. get him out of OKC because they need a better coach. Like. There's no way that Paul George should be should be settling for contested shots. There's no. no way Russ Westbrook should be out there running down the floor taking threes in early shot clock situations. There's no way any of this should be happening. No. There's a lack of pick and roll. Like a Russell Westbrook, Stephen Adams pick and roll should be undefendable. There's no way you should be leaving Terrence Ferguson on an island with CJ McCollum. All it's day just either. it doesn't like, make sense. There's just a sense. lot of things that just didn't add up. And then there's t- like they're showing it right now where OKC got within four points, and the way that they got within four points was Russ driving to the basket and then creating plays, either dunking, layup, or making a pass to an open Paul George we on the have, wing. We have sang it from the mountaintops on this podcast. The pressure that Russell Westbrook puts on the rim every single time he holds the ball is insane. It's like Datsuk with the puck in the forwards. Like, yes. something's about to happen. And, again, like, and it frees up guys on yeah. the corners to shoot. Like, Paul George on the wing, Terrence Ferguson on the wing, get open to shoot when yeah. Russell Westbrook drives to the basket. So they do it a bunch of times. They get within four points, and then all of a sudden they're like, can't, can't no, shoot. Like, <laughs> uh, fuck that. Let's have Terrence Ferguson and Jeremy Grant bring the ball up the floor. Like, go more with Russ off the ball. Like, bring Schroeder in. They play better with Schroeder on the ball. Like, and Schroeder can shoot. Exactly. Not phenomenally, but nobody on their team shoots phenomenally. Like, Paul George is far and away their best shooter. They don't really, like, it's the team all year. I said this to you today. It's the team all year that couldn't shoot. And now, like, oh, guess what? They can't shoot. Yeah, and I guess, you know, Damian Lillard proved that he is not a playoff fraud anymore. No, Logo Lillard. Oh, I mean, he was, I mean, like 2014 was his second year. He hit that big shot in the winner in the playoffs. I don't know if he was ever a playoff fraud. It was, yeah, that's, yeah, I saw him. somebody say, is this the year Damian Lillard proves he's not a fraud? And I almost responded, I know it's a long time ago, but he did hit yeah. a game winner at and the buzzer keeps, in game like, seven of a playoff series. Every time so, he's had a chance with a good team, somebody gets hurt right away, right before. And it's just tough. They've won playoff series. They beat the Clippers in one of those playoff series. Like, he's been okay. Um, all right. So the last game, speaking of the team that Damian Lillard sent home in 2014, mm-hmm. the team and the player, the game we've watched the least because the second half was on when we were recording yep. this. Uh, Rockets and Jazz, I have a final score update for you. Was it like 99-something? Mm, sure wasn't. No. The Rockets that was won the end of three. My fault. The Rockets won one twenty two to ninety. Um, man, I really I wanted Utah to get anyone other than Houston. <laughs> like this I, is just, the like I thought bad, that this bad matchup. For I Utah. thought that this might be a really interesting series. 
This is not going it's, to be an interesting it's, it's series. A, it's a bad matchup for Utah. It's a bad one. Let's see what Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell was a minus 20. He had 19 points on 18 shots. Not great. Uh, zero assists. Not great. They're just telling him to go attack the basket like they do every year in the playoffs with him. Well, Ricky, two years. Ricky Rubio, six assists. Rudy Gobert. By the way, we can lump Rudy Gobert all over that Defensive Player of the Year award every year because of the stifle tower. Right. Dude, when this guy gets into the playoffs, he gets abused. He's he's not as solid as everybody thinks. Like it's I don't know what it is because he is really good defensively well, in the regular season. But when we get to the play, what's like, the stereotype for European big man? Like it, Dirk's the only one who ever broke that mold. When he finally won a title in 2011, that ended the saga of European big men are all soft. There's really only one guy who's been the best player on a team as a European big man who's ever done anything, and it's Dirk. And I don't know if maybe the rest of the European big men might be a little bit soft. Not like the Nurkic's of the world. There are certainly other examples. But Rudy Gobert just might be a little bit soft. This is a dude who cried at a press conference when he didn't make an all-star team. Like, there's a chance he's just a little soft. Capella, also a European big man, not quite as soft. But, like, Capella also has a track record of people saying he can be played off the floor a little bit. Sure. Still can't do anything other than run at the rim. He, like offensively, he just that's it. He did Roll a pretty hard. he did a pretty decent job on on Rudy Gobert tonight. Mm-hmm. Sixteen points on uh, eight of thirteen. Yeah, and it's like Gobert, all he can do is get close to the rim offensively. Yeah, exactly, that's it. It's Boban, but Boban can at least shoot. All he can do defensively is just stand in front of the rim, like he's basically in duct tape. Mm-hmm. And it's I think like that's part of why he just gets. Killed. And it's like Harden can take him down low. It's Capella can take him down low because Capella is one of the better rebounders in the league. Yeah. I just. I, I tell you what, PJ Tucker can handle him. And then one of my all time favorite tweets has to come back up today uh, because it's from Salt Lake City Dunk, the SB Nation blog for the Utah Jazz, with one of the more hilarious Twitter accounts in all of SB Nation. I'm guessing this tweet didn't age very well. Sure didn't. Yeah. Uh, jazz fans to Gordon Hayward, you could have had a statue. Donovan Mitchell, hold my beer. Jazz fans to Gordon Hayward said a lot of weird things. I didn't, you know. Have fun being LeBron's B word. <laughs> Guess what? Gordon Hayward missed the only season that LeBron played in the East. True. Yeah, Le- <laughs> Gordon Hayward sure isn't LeBron's no, B word. He's definitely not LeBron's B word. Donovan Mitchell. Probably not yet either, but he does have to play LeBron at some point in the playoff series, more than likely. Not this year. No, not this year. No, <laughs> absolutely not, not this year. year. But at some point, if he wants to win a title, like eventually LeBron will be somewhere where like it will go through him again, right? Like, or is this just like Bird? Like it ended in '86 and we never saw him again. You know, he might not. Yeah. I remember I wanted to talk about Anthony Davis just really quickly, oh, yeah. <laughs> and I remember where I wanted to talk about Anthony Davis. First of all, <laughs> this was just that was a funny one. It got he's so lucky Magic resigned. Nobody even talked yeah. about. Yeah, it. Yeah, seriously, like, he's so lucky Magic resigned. Now, I, mixtape did an episode. They talked a lot about Anthony Davis. They did a really good job with it. I thought it was one hilarious as always, yes. and two, it was just. Nobody gives a fuck about Anthony Davis anymore. It, like the thing Tyler kept saying was Anthony Davis is a top five player, but all anyone will ever talk about now is the year that he imploded the Pelicans. He did. And th- people are saying, "Is this guy going to turn into Dwight Howard?" But like you can, it's that like you can blame him for that, or you can blame the like the Magic put a team around Dwight Howard. They went to a finals. Like, sure, and again, the Pelicans, the Pelicans failed Anthony like, Davis. Unequivocally, at every step and every level, have failed him masterfully. Like, it's been an epic fail job. But the he has handled this exit as poorly as he possibly it's, could. It's, you know what? You remember the beginning of the year when they were like, if this starts to go south, it's going to get ugly. And is Anthony Davis going to be okay with making it ugly? Probably not. Two weeks later, he hired Rich Paul, and everybody knew it was coming. And it's it's, it's like just, he doesn't want to make it ugly. Rich Paul specializes in making it ugly. It's like you want to wear that shirt. Cool. That was come. On. Steer I mean, into the skin. For those of you who don't know, Anthony Davis showed up to the last game in a game as a in Pelican, which he did not play, wearing a shirt that had "That's All, Folks" on it, and 
th- again, thank God Magic retired because yeah. it got Anthony Davis out of the crossfire. Like, no, like you could have leaned into him and like, oh yeah, I just signed on to Space Jam two or something like that. Like, no, I don't pick. That's up my really, clothes. and that's <laughs> even what Coley said. He was like, the all time spin zone for that is, oh, I just signed into Space Jam right. two. And then even if it's not true, dude, your agent's Rich Paul. You yeah. could make it true you in can a get second. In Space Jam, like you can't get in Space Jam. He can't get anybody. He doesn't want Anthony Davis. Yeah, he, it would have been a no brainer. Oh, yeah. I'm in Space Jam two. That's why I wore the shirt instead. Uh, I didn't even pick out my clothes. That was just there for me. Like uh, Anthony David, the I've, funniest the, thing to about say, it is, I have no control over that. The funniest what if thing he had about giving you a shirt with a swastika on it. Yeah, Do you have no control seriously. over it? I just like, wear whatever's in there. Like they just pick it out for me. The funniest thing about it too is he's on the record saying the biggest thing about this exit is I want to go out on my own terms. I want to have full control over my destiny. I'm yeah. my own boss. That's what yeah. he said on the shop. I'm my I'm own my boss. Own boss. Uh, except for no, when dude, it comes to basketball. picking out my clothes, <laughs> like, yeah. like I, I make every decision in my life except for what I wear. Like, dude, you, like as much as I like understand the powers with the players in that league, like you're not your own boss. You're a basketball player. But. Now I wanted to talk about him when we were talking about Toronto and Orlando, and the reason I wanted to do it is because I think it's it's not a straight line comparison. Obviously, the East is not as difficult as the West. Right. But it is kind of a straight line comparison because Orlando is You're talking not about Dwight as, Howard comp. No. Orlando is not as good as the Pelicans on paper. Right now? Right. If you take all of the pieces that the Pelicans have and you assume Anthony Davis plays 70 games, you also have Drew Holiday. You also have Julius Randle playing fringe all-star never, level basketball. Never trade Miritich. Yeah, if, again, like, yeah, if Anthony Alfred Davis Payton plays... Stays healthy. Yeah, if Anthony Davis plays 70 games, Miritich is still on the team. On paper, they had a better shot to make the playoffs than Orlando. Nico Vucevic dragged they, his I team mean, to the playoffs. They won a playoff series last year. Like, yeah. In four games. Nico Vucevic yeah. took his team to the playoffs in a year where Anthony Davis couldn't and didn't even try. In a contract year for Nico Vucevic, nonetheless, made an all-star team. Like, it's just, I'm t- I, he might be Dwight Howard. And it would kill me to see it because I love Anthony Davis. I love seeing him play. Actually, I can't say I love Anthony Davis. I hate Anthony Davis, I, the way just, he's handled all this. I like, love watching mean, him play. You don't play. mean Dwight Howard from like a, his game standpoint. It could. But, like, I mean, Anthony Davis can do way more on offense than Dwight Howard could. That's true, but, like, could it just deteriorate? Because no, it, I mean, he's could not the distractions shoot. get to that like, point where, he like... He can still shoot. Like, he can still do those. He's yeah. dangerous from everywhere. Like, he's a better offensive player by a long shot than Dwight Howard was. Dwight Howard was a three-time defensive player of the year when he got traded to L.A. Like, I'm not trying to take away from Dwight Howard. He was dominant. He but, was... like. I mean, Shaq never gave Dwight Howard the Superman thing for a reason. Like, he knew who Dwight Howard really was. That's fair. Like, I just I wonder if Anthony Davis because I think a big part of what happened with Dwight Howard was letting all the off the court stuff get in the way of the on the court. Well, stuff. I mean, once he put his arm around Stan in that press conference, it was just it and was I, over. Yeah, now I'm like, I wonder if Anthony Davis is going to do the same thing where this off the court shit there gets moments, in the way, like him leaving the game in the middle of the game with Rich Paul, like when he had the injury. Like there, there's that. There's the that's all, folks. There's the taking him out of all the promotional stuff and the pregame videos. There, there's some moments where, like on both sides, New Orleans and Anthony Davis, where it's been like that could have been handled better. Yeah. But I think just Dwight Howard's a little extreme there because he, he – but, like, that's the dude – remember, he got on the bus and was like, screw it, I'm signing. And it was his agent, Dan Fagan, rest in peace, who was, like, putting his cousin with him to, and telling him, don't let him sign that. Yeah. And he still got on the bus after a win and was like, yep, I'm staying, guys, one more year, and then they traded him. Not great. Yeah, yeah not great. Yeah, I, I just can't quite put him there yet because he, it- didn't, he didn't want to make it dirty. That's why he got Rich Paul. And his dad. It is the the one thing that is interesting to me is just Anthony Davis did something so egregious that he was airbrushed out of promotional yeah, material. That's a wild one. And like that is, I think, more what he's going to be known for now than his play is. Depends, dude. If he you're goes kind of an and asshole. He, yeah. it, but if he goes and he wins, then all is forgotten. And True. It's fine. All right, we ran super long, I so let's wrap did. this thing up. Yeah. Uh, have a good week, everybody that listened. Thanks for listening. And like multiple part this episode. You got plenty of it. It's basically like a whole playoff breakdown. Pretty much. Okay. This is we're like we're gonna end up having three hour episodes. We're like the mixtape of Detroit Sports Here Podcast. Are. Here we are. Wonderful. All right. See you next week. Later.